Good morning and welcome to the Caregiver Teleconnection. My name is Glenda Rogers and I'm going to be the facilitator for today's session. Today we have with us Evelyn Greb and she's going to be talking to us about isolation and caregiving. And she has a subtitle of that that's kind of interesting. It's approaching the cliff. So we're going to ask her about that. Uh, Evelyn, thank you so much for being with us this morning. Uh, before you get started, would you tell people a little bit about you in case they haven't seen you before on one of our sessions? Well, I'm really young and really good looking. You just can't <laughs> see. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> no, actually, um, I've worked in San Diego County for the last 50 years with elderly and disabled people and their caregivers. So and I've been on the teleconnection with Glenda for the last 12 years, or is it 13 it's now? 13, Glenda? 13, <laughs> lucky 13. <laughs> yes. And so much of what I will be talking about today is, is kind of an accumulation of what we've learned from you caregivers um, and talking about your care recipients. And, and I want to really, let me tell you what my goal is today. My goal is to scare the Piwadden oh. out of you um, because isolation, there's so much research that shows how isolation is devastating. And for caregivers, it's even worse, um, you know, because they feel so, well, we'll talk about all their feelings. But what I would really like at the end is for us to all brainstorm about what you do, how you take care of yourself, because my real message is you need to be rabid as a caregiver about taking care of you. And I think she was going to lecture us today. So <laughs> no, I said it was going to be the minister. <laughs> well, that's right. That's right. Now, for those of you that just joined us, there's nothing wrong with your setup or your computer. Evelyn is just um, on, her, <laughs> on her microphone today. She's having some technical difficulties with her um, camera. Uh, so we aren't going to be able to see her, but we will be able to hear her as she goes through this session today. So thank you for being with us and thank you for your patience. All right, Evelyn, let's get started. So why are we especially concerned about caregivers more than anybody else? Okay, let me ask the caregivers on this call, on this Zoom, these questions. And please take a minute, maybe close your eyes and really think about the answer. Have you felt the world closing in on you? Maybe at night when you go to bed during the day? Have you felt like your life has taken a decided turn for the worse? Have you felt resentment at being confined within your caregiving role? Have you felt like you are falling off the cliff of being you? And this is why it's so important for caregivers, because they're so vulnerable. Vulnerable in the sense that they not only are taking care of themselves, they're taking care of someone else, that their time is gobbled up with all of these different things they need to do. And it also depends on who they care for and why they do it. You know, a friend or a neighbor or family, and how much support that they have or maybe don't have, and what your own health condition is. Now, I wanna talk a little bit, just one minute, about the current epidemics and how they're adding to the stress. The COVID, mental health issues, inability to get mental health assistance, um, except for you know, uh, phone calls, um, AIDS, RSV with the kids, opioids, there are so many things that are stressing caregivers these days and their families. Evelyn? Yes. <laughs> okay, so we are concerned about caregivers and we are also concerned about the people they care for. So talk a little bit about that, the care yeah. recipients. This is the part that I've added because it's we have heard from so many people, you know, about the different things going on with their care recipients. You know, they lose their friends because the care recipient maybe has dementia and they repeat all the time or people are um, anxious and unaware of how to approach somebody with dementia 
or you know, somebody in a wheelchair or somebody who's blind. You know, so I think it's really important that we think about isolation in terms of the care recipient, not just the caregiver. And for persons who are cognitively aware, these are care recipients, the stimulation is so important. It's what keeps people, you know, it, it helps from losing your cognition, for, from losing it every day. And caregivers may often be the only social contact. So if they get burned out, who's providing that for our care recipients? And that need for interaction is paramount. And I've got some quotes later that you'll really be surprised at. And these are from academic studies. Um, I think it's difficult for persons, even if you're cognitively aware too, when you have those unfamiliar, um, when, when you have people around who are unfamiliar with declining senses, whether it's hearing, you know, if you're hard of hearing and your hearing aids turn down or you don't have one, if you're blind, and what I said before, if you're in a wheelchair, many people look over your head instead of into your eyes. And it's even worse for the care recipients with diminished cognition or with any dementia because the presentation of the caregiver affects their mood and behavior. We know that one of the things that they can sense into the very end stages of dementia is what their caregiver is feeling, what kind of mood they're in. Are they angry? You know, is something going wrong? Are they anxious? Are they upset? And that just directly affects the mood and behavior of the dementia client. And isolated caregivers, when they get burnout, you know what burnout equals? I mean, I don't care anymore. I can't do it. I, I just don't care. So we don't want that for our care recipients because that's a real um, end of the road. And the lack of interaction, um, if you do get burned out, results in behavior problems. Behavior problems may result in abuse, neglect, irritability, anger, sadness, um, not wanting to even respond. Hmm. I would think that as a caregiver, if you are the person that is primarily um, interacting with the care recipient, and so you are responsible for them not being isolated, that's even more pressure on the caregiver. Uh, it's just really uh, adding on to what their other duties already are. Um, just so that we're on the same play page here, uh, why don't you go ahead and define isolation for us? Well, you know, isolation and loneliness are often used to mean the same thing. And the CDC came out with some definitions because they say they're not the same thing. This is the Center for Disease Control. What they say is isolation is a lack of social connection. And that is, I think, the isolation that we're specifically talking about today because it affects some 25% of older adults. And of course, it can lead to loneliness or loneliness can lead to isolation. But isolation is really about, you know, losing or not having time for or not not knowing how to reach out and get those connections that you need so much. Loneliness is subjective. You know, if what you want in a relationship is not what you have, then you may feel lonely. You know, teenagers feel lonely. So that's not it's they, and they say 43 percent of older adults report feeling lonely. That's from the CDC. Um, no, that's not, that's from the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. So we've got some, we've got some research. We can talk a little bit more about, you know, what they have found out about isolation. Mm, yeah, that's pretty staggering, 43%. Wow. So my next question is, are we talking about all care, caregivers, professional, family, you know, whatever kind of caregiver you might be? Yeah, thanks for asking, Glenda, because I think we need to clarify that, you know, professional caregivers or healthcare workers in general, you know, have uh, maybe a little different kind of stress and not to say that they don't feel isolated, but generally they're out in the public. They have lots of contacts and, and connections, whether those are intimate or whether or not. But we're talking about family caregivers here or any primary caregiver who is unpaid who may be taking care of a friend or a neighbor 
um, and certainly those with you know family members that they're trying to take care of. And remember, you know that 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 loneliness can come from being with somebody that you don't feel connected to. So oftentimes the caregivers of folks with dementia are lonely in addition to being isolated. Mm -hmm. Now we're talking of the, of the caregivers 40 or that we have older adults, 40% are men, 60% are women. Um, of all caregivers, 40% are millennials, uh, age 22 to 38. That's a big number, it keeps growing. Happy to hear that. Um, and then we have to talk about the older adults in rural areas. And certainly I think Texas is one of those areas, you know, we're one of those states that has a lot of rural areas, just like California does, you know, where there's no access to services. People move out of town because they want beautiful trees or mountains or, you know, um, to, to be left alone. And then, you know, when they get older and if they get, you know, some kind of functional, um, problems or they get some illnesses any chronic illnesses they have a difficult time they can you know spend a, a day going into a doctor but there's no home health there's no you know area agency on aging services that want to go out and travel 50 miles you know for an hour or two visit so the rural caregivers are really um yeah sol um it's estimated that there are 53 million u.s adults who are providing uh, caregiving, and that's by AARP in a 2020 report. And then we've got this other group, totally uncounted, unsupported in the US, an estimated 1 million eight to 18 year olds. Millions of caregivers have become caregivers because of COVID, because of opioid um, epidemic, and they become caregivers without, you know, having any preparation and perhaps not even having the maturity, you know, to deal with it in a way that, you know, might be optimum. So we just want to talk about how important it is, um, you know, for people to get the training that they need to be a caregiver. And I want to just say that on Thursday, Dr. Elliot Sklar and Lucy will be doing a presentation on diversity and caregiving for healthcare workers in case any of you are on the phone, because that should be a really good one and talk about some of those same issues. Well, every time we have a session describing caregivers, I'm always amazed at, at what I hear so that others can kind of maybe self-identify, I'll call it that. Why don't you talk about what it is that family caregivers are actually doing here in the United States? Yes, you know that the average of caregiving, um, the time of caregiving for one of for your care recipient, the average is four years, according to AARP. However, Glenda and I have talked about this before. Mm -hmm. You know, some that's an average between maybe somebody who had a heart attack and died in two weeks, or you know, caregiving for a dementia person who lives on and on and on. My um, massage therapist actually has a mom who's been in a nursing home, totally late stage dementia for 20 years. Yeah. So it all depends on who it is. But what they do, these caregivers, oh my gosh, shopping, food prep, cleaning, bathing, hygiene, Medicaid, medication management, money management, making, driving to appointments, care planning, legal planning, keeping family informed and being supportive. And then on top of that, they're supposed to be cheerful, you know, so that they don't scare their loved one off and they're supposed to have time to take care of themselves. And that's what we need to figure out. So caring for a person with dementia compounds all of that. You know, you're doing it for two people now, trying to take care of two people and all of the difficult and multiple tasks that uh, caregivers are often asked to do, they require education and training. You know what else they require? Respite. Mm. They, re they require rabid self-care or you won't make it. So that's my, that I'm preaching. I am preaching today. Yeah. Well, I think we need to preach about this. Yeah. Self-care is so important. So what have you discovered are the main causes of isolation in caregiving? 
Well, number one is a dependent care recipient. Mm. And it's whether it's functional, you know, whether it's because of illness, whether it's because of injury, whether it's because of dementia, you know, if you feel responsible for the outcome of someone else's life, you know, then you begin to change your, your sense of values. You, you oftentimes put your loved one or your care recipient in front of yourself in terms of importance. And that's what this is all about. Because when that happens, you let go of your gym, you let go of your walking, you let go of your morning exercise, and that's what we can't do. You know, what else really affects it is living alone. You know, some caregivers don't live with the care recipient and living alone is highly um, collaborated with isolation. Loss of family and friends is often caused by caring for someone with dementia. But even if you just lose them because you're getting older, I know I've lost a couple of friends lately as they've gotten into their 80s and 90s and 100, 101 actually, you know, and you lose your friends and it's hard to make new friends as we age because of a lot of different things. Ageism is one of them. Uh, I think the sensory impairments we talked about, certainly one of the biggest ones, the loss of independence is based on your loss of your driver's license. So the minute your care recipient loses a driver's license, um, and that's often a very difficult thing, it causes them to feel more isolated. They probably sit around more often. They probably watch more TV. They probably need more interaction instead of less. Low income is a risk for isolation. And part of that is because of neighborhoods, you know, the vulnerable and at risk, the people who have the, the screens around their house, the wrought iron, because they live in neighborhoods, they don't feel safe. You know, they don't leave the front door open. Um, and all of this adds up to, you know, that cycle of depression where it starts that, all right, you're sad. Nobody cares about you. Nobody's looking, you know, to take care of you. Nobody wants to um, come into your house or come and see you because of either the problems with the care recipient as perceived by your, you know, the people who used to be your social network, or simply because you've run out of a social network um, for all these different reasons. That cycle of depression then leads right to that cliff. It's a downward spiral. And the bottom of the cliff is when there's when you jump off the cliff is when nothing matters anymore. And that's burnout. Oh, and it's real. So I know how I would answer this question, but I'm interested to, to hear your answer. Um, do you feel that caregivers are more vulnerable? Well, yeah. In addition to that previous list, I think they're often managing multiple medical tasks for their loved ones, for which many times they're not trained. You know, you get a discharge plan where you're supposed to um, test the AC1 levels or where you're supposed to use a Hoyer lift and you're the caregiver. And you don't, you never even heard these words before, much less know how to take a blood sample or how to, you know, measure insulin and give a shot. You know, so many times, you know, people don't have the kind of training that they need. And again, this is worse for caregivers who are in rural areas um, worse for caregivers who have any kind of sensory problems. Um, I think it's they may have placed their loved one in a facility too, and that you know what happens then is both people become more more isolated because now you've got one person living alone, probably with less money, and you've got another person living somewhere else. And I know people who spend twelve hours a day in nursing homes, and it didn't really solve their problem of not having time for themselves because of the choice that they're making. So we have to make different choices. We've got to make good choices. We have to be rabid about ourselves here. <laughs> it isn't that the truth. <laughs> and also people have family that's distant, sometimes by location, oftentimes from what we've heard, by intent. You know, if you're willing to do the job, hey, we're going to let you do it. 
you know, I don't, you know, I'm busy too. I'm busy, you know, a guy would do it, but I'm busy. I got kids, you know, I know you have kids, but I have kids too. And, you know, they're busy. They're going into all these sports and they go to school and blah, blah. And it is blah, blah, because they could always do something, even if it's paying for respite to help you out. Um, you may have difficulty reaching out due to chronic illness, ageism, or functional disability. And these are things, you know, I remember when I first started working with the disabled and working with people in wheelchairs and knowing how to approach them, knowing how to talk to someone with cystic fibrosis who talked back, but you couldn't understand them until you got used to the cadence of their, of their messages. It's very difficult. It's people get anxious if they're around something they don't know. If, if it's around, if they're around something that they don't feel comfortable with. So if you have any of, you know, chronic illness or a disability, it may be that that's creating more isolation for you too. And one of the things that we have heard from people is they feel guilty when they leave somebody, that when they leave their care recipient to go have fun, you know, to go to the gym, to, you know, go to a movie, to be with a friend, to play cards. They feel guilty. And we got to get rid of that stuff. That's one of the things we got to get rid of. And we one, one of a list of several. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, I'm going on and on here. Well, well, but that's probably one of the main ones that we hear. I think you'd agree with that, Evelyn, is that people feel guilty or they feel that somebody else can't do it as well as they do. I know I've heard that a lot. Or they can't afford help. That's, um, that's or the, very real. And the care recipient doesn't want somebody else to help them because yeah. they're stubborn and they just want you because they're used to you and they love you. Well, let's talk about the care recipient. Are they more vulnerable? Hmm. Hmm. Um, yeah. Geez, they lost their independence. Independence, And it may be because of functional decline. Uh, maybe they can't walk very well anymore or can't dial the phone can't go to the bank, lost their driver's license. Uh, maybe they're you know, pretty ill, got some kind of immune problem. Maybe they're in pain because a lot of people have chronic pain that keeps them from wanting to, to go out, to get dressed up, to take a shower, you know, to be social. And all of that leads to depression. And that's for those who don't have dementia, but those with dementia are even more vulnerable. And especially if their caregiver is feeling isolated and close to the cliff. That is so true. And oh, I don't know, it, can't, it gets me for sure. Well, um, let's talk about how COVID has affected uh, caregiving. I know it's, it's obvious that it has, but why don't you discuss that a bit and tell us how that, um, are we at the end of the tunnel? I don't know, but yeah, talk about COVID and caregiving. Well, you know, I think the lockdowns and social distancing really magnified isolation for all of us as our social structures moved online, as we were told to stay at home, as we were told to wear a mask when nobody can see if you're smiling or, um, you know, if you're talking or what you look like. There was a U.S. Today poll from May 2020 said two thirds of Americans during the, the beginning of COVID reported nervousness depression, loneliness, and hopelessness in the week before the poll. And I think we can all identify with some of that. I know I can, you know, and caregivers have the additional anxiety and fear regarding their, the one person that they're caring for, you know, making trips to the doctor, how many people put off their trips for, um, for tests, for prevention, you know, for their regular checkups, uh, hospitalizations and replacements, you know, hospitalizations were, you couldn't even go in and visit as a caregiver. So talk about isolating. Um, they were in isolation. Um, and placement, a lot of caregivers, I think, delayed placement, which can lead to despair. You know, when you feel like you finally got a solution to too much on your back, too much on your shoulders, and then this COVID happened and you, you're afraid to place somebody and the nursing homes are afraid to take your person 
without all kinds of tests and making sure that they don't have COVID. And the staff, you know, we know from the research that we've heard from Dr. Sklar is many of the staff, especially on the night shift, don't even have their COVID shots. So there's a lot to worry about. And of course, the introduction of paid caregivers and, the, and their COVID status. So you probably tended to just take care of everything yourself and build up that kind of fence around you that kept you, that's keeping you isolated or kept you isolated. There's also the loss of access to home-based services. People you know, who were doing home care, unless it was urgent, pretty much just talked to you on the phone. All right. And the feeling that no one cares when you're isolated. So according to um, the Gerontological Society of America, they have many references on their site. And what we're going to tell you about our resources later. And, the, and also the Medicare Nursing Home Compare, because I think things have gotten a little better in nursing homes. But I certainly wouldn't say it's the end of the tunnel, Glenna. Well, and I agree with you 100%, because I think COVID is with us. Um, and is going to continue to present um, big decisions that have to be made as we move forward. I see that in, in, in my personal life. You know, I get an email, hey, well, I was exposed to COVID and I wanted to let you know because I was with you. And, and so just think about that if you're a caregiver. Um, it just is amplified in my mind. So, yeah, I think it's with us and it's going to be with us, making it harder. Um, We've talked a lot about, about isolation. It's important not to be isolated, but actually what are the effects of isolation on someone? Well, here comes some of the big research. The Scientist magazine in July 13th, 2020, says absence of human contact is associated with declines in cognitive function. Cognitive function is a brain-based skill needed to acquire knowledge, manipulate information, and be able to reason. So think of what you lose when you don't have human contact. It also said that it can change brain chemicals, the kinds of chemicals, and we heard a lot about neuroscience lately, and this is what they're talking about, that what, those, what that change brings is increased inflammatory processes, so your body is, you know, any, any joint that you have that's under stress or that you've had before, maybe you had a knee replacement, that's all going to be affected by this increased inflammatory process. Decreased cognitive function, um, this is very interesting. There was a study by a woman named Catherine Oford, and she said that studies of solitary confinement found result confinement found results was, and excuse me, was, um, oh, it resulted in difficulty thinking or remembering. It created obsessive thinking, hallucination, psychotic symptoms, and an increased rate of suicide. Now, isn't that scary? Are you guys scared yet? I want you to be I'm scared. scared. I'm scared. <laughs> I know, I want you to be scared because we can't let ourselves be second. We have to be first. Yeah, and if you think about how long, and we talked about this a little earlier in the session, how long some of these caregiving situations can last, it is really scary. But I don't think you've covered it all yet. Aren't there some other effects that you want to tell us about? Yeah, how did you know? <laughs> yeah, really, how did I know? I'm just, I'm just trying to scare the poop out of people. <laughs> yeah, well, take your time, it's scaring us, Evelyn. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the Centers for Disease um, Control uh, also says isolation and loneliness are getting to a level of a public health epidemic with the risks that include, and this is from their writing, premature death as often as people who are morbidly obese or who smoke or who are not engaged in any activity you know, for their body. It's a 50% increase in the risk of Alzheimer's if you're isolated. We don't want that either. And mm -hmm. other dementias. And that was one study by Cigna that says that doubles the risk of getting Alzheimer's. An approximately 30% increase of heart disease and stroke. This is from the CDC. Higher rates of depression, anxiety, and suicide. 
and an increase in chronic illness and the severity of chronic illness. And that's because that immune system goes right in the toilet when you're isolating. And Dr. Cole, who's done a lot of work with the elderly and trying to get people, you know, to really recognize the different needs, especially physicians and healthcare workers, is at UCLA. You'll love this quote, isolation and loneliness act as a fertilizer for other diseases. And who knew? <laughs> who knew this was so uh, desperate a situation? Um, and I'm so glad it's coming to light and that research is being done on it because a lot of times that's where we move forward is through research. Right. I'm going to skip to slide 13. Uh, righty, go right ahead. Because <laughs> <laughs> I don't have numbers on my slides. Because I have more effects. <laughs> oh, more effects. <laughs> Lovely. Just what we wanted. <laughs> The Family Caregiver Association report says you gain weight when you're isolated because you're eating emotionally. They say your increased blood pressure, their blood pressure goes up due to stress. Um, you have an increased risk of diabetes, stroke, and death, which is pretty much what CDC said. The National Institute of Mental Health says depres depression increases if you are lonely or isolated, uh, isolation increases risk of chronic disease. Uh, if you have a family history for depression, um, if it misuse, and that's interesting because uh, it sounds redundant. Depression increases if you have a family history for depression. Most of, or many of the suicides, a, a good, not majority, but a percentage of suicides Someone in your family committed suicide. And many times this was because of depression. Mm -hmm. could, have started, could have started with isolation, could have started with misuse of alcohol or drugs, or perhaps a stressful life event like divorce or death of a spouse, or caring for someone with a chronic illness and becoming totally isolated. So folks, are you convinced yet that isolation is not a good thing for you or your care recipient? And why does it matter? Because isolation can be deadly. I'm convinced. <laughs> I'm convinced. <laughs> I'm very depressed too, so thank you so much. Uh, <laughs> if you want to go back and talk about how our care recipients are affected, we've been talking a lot about our caregivers. I think I hit that. Thanks, Thanks very much. Yes. Um, Okay, you know, this is where I really like to go. So let's get going with this. We heard all these horrible things and we've heard how important it is. What can we do about it? Well, Glenda, I'd like to, um, at the end of this, uh, have the caregivers tell us what they're doing about it. Because I think we can have a lot to learn here. Yeah. But for right now, let me just say, um, this is kind of an emergency, you know? People don't have energy when they're caregiving. How do we get energy? How do we, you know, protect our health, our atti atti attitude? How do we have time for self-care? We know we have to reach out and connect with others more often and be compassionate and kind to ourselves and a care recipient. And we can keep track of our thoughts and manage them. And that's really important because what we know is you can have negative thoughts or you can have positive thoughts. And you have the ability within your brain to change those around, to make those negative thoughts. Let's go like, let me put that in some positive light. You know, I'm not feeling well today. Oh, you know what? I feel better than I did yesterday. You know, my back doesn't hurt as much as it did yesterday. So think about how to manage your thoughts. Sometimes it helps to journal when you do that. Um, some people journal. Others, I know I like to go to bed at night and say, well, how things go today? You know, what could I do different? What could I have done better? What did I leave out? Um, you know, so with stress, we have to change our focus. You know, we have to take a walk. We have to read, cook, study, stay strong, smile. And I'm doing this as a quick list because I really want some time to hear from those caregivers. Um, we've talked a lot about exercise and what we know is people have told us, oh yeah, that was such a great program. But you know, after these programs, I always go sit on the couch and turn the TV on. 
Hmm. So what we want to do is encourage you, start small, you know, say, oh, I'm going to walk around one block today, maybe two blocks tomorrow, but today it's going to be one block. I'm going to get outside and do that and figure out a way to do it. We've got to figure out how to do this. It all sounds good, but you're probably saying to yourself, who has time for that? You know, who has the energy for that? And I'm hoping you can help us and help all the other caregivers, you know, have some ideas what you do, what's worked for you, what hasn't worked for you. And with that, I'd ask you all to get creative and to um, give us what you do. It's about baby steps, right? You yep. Baby steps. Um, let's let's turn to the chat box for a minute. And we have some people that have called in, so I'm going to read this. And this can be a jumping off point for us um, with Deborah. Uh, Deborah writes that I am isolated and older and lonely. I'm the only caregiver for a husband with severe Lou body dementia. Psychosis is very scary. Yes, it is, Deborah. Um, I've been caring for my husband for over 10 years. Here's another one of those examples that four years is kind of on the low side. I do everything alone. No family, no support available, no respite available at a price I can afford. We talked about that, that the cost is just you know, prohibitive to some people. My attempts to reach out and feel connected just plain fail. Zoom meetings do not work. I get that, Deborah. I can I can't get away. I can never get away, especially in the evenings. So Deborah needs your help. We need your help. Let's brainstorm and um, talk about ways that maybe Deborah can connect and work on this isolation. Anybody have any? comments um for us or for deborah she's with us and obviously needs needs our support and help has anything worked for you in addressing um isolation this is serious this is very serious yeah it is uh, Becca says, I'm sure you've looked into many resources, but there isn't a, is there an adult day services program in your area? Good question. Good question. If she's rural, probably not. If she's in a more metropolitan area, maybe that is available. Um, so Deborah, that's a good, good suggestion for you. Um, yes. And I would say, you know, we have to spend time figuring it out. Now, I'm sure her husband sleeps sometimes. Um, she probably needs to sleep too. But sleep uh -huh. can make you sleepier, you know, because what you're doing is you're, you're letting go. Of, you're trying to let go of the stress that you feel. But if you did a little exercise, if you did a five minute walk, if you did five minutes uh, you know, some kind of jack, jumping jacks or um, stretching, deep breathing, something like that, five minutes. You know, we have to figure out how to give ourselves a break. And there's always a way. We're creative human beings. You know, we just have to think about it positively. What are the things I can do? You know, and I will do them and I will make a plan to do them and I will stick to the plan. We have to be creative and we have to figure out how to take care of ourselves. And Deborah, I am really, you got, you know, a big load on your hands. And I want you to know, you either need to find placement for your husband or you need to figure out how to take care of yourself better because you sound like you're getting really close to that cliff. Oh, and understandably so after that length of time. Absolutely. Um, yeah, for sure. So Jen uh, says that I just started by connecting back to myself through nature and nature is so important. And I think just walking out to the mailbox and back is good. At night for five minutes, I walk onto a grassy patch barefoot. Oh, how interesting. Feeling the earth. Sometimes I flick my fingers to shoo away all of the energy that I've picked up. It just, and just, yeah, don't don't want. So she's saying that she's doing some things because she gets a lot of energy from that. 
Good, good suggestion. Okay, Deborah says that she does exercise regularly, but it doesn't help me to find and connect with other people. So I think she's got both, you know, isolation and loneliness going on here. Certainly um, sounds like it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, have you tried? Have you tried the um, the chat room on Alzheimer's on the Alzheimer's uh, website? Alz. Dot org. Dot de connected dot org. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Becca says the shooing away sounds like great nervous system regulation. Hmm. I like that. I do too. Yeah. Sounds like she's been listening to Dr. Jamie Heisman. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> for sure. For sure. And Deborah, I understand that being on Zoom and looking at people on a screen on your computer or your phone, that that, that is not doesn't feel like a real personal connection. And I would probably venture to say that you're missing the human touch as well. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if you have connected with the Area Agency on Aging in your area, because many of them, depending on funding and depending on what time of the year, do have funds to pay for respite for caregivers. So if you haven't done that, that would be another suggestion. Um, and then if we could get you respite, we could get you over to support group where you would have human contact. Um, so maybe that would help. Um, Jen says it is, it is absolutely about nervous system regulation. A friend offers different drills that each take about three minutes and that's not very long. Yeah, for sure. There's also online support groups, which aren't like hugging somebody or seeing them, but yeah. um, many times it's, you know, better than at least you can talk to somebody, you can, you know, tell them about, and and some sometimes maybe you'll get online with somebody who has some suggestions. I don't know if you live in a rural area, area Deborah, um, but that always makes it harder to get services in. It sounds like you've had a tough time. Um, and again, I'm wondering if you've considered placement. Well, I would say after 10 years um, and she's dealing with the psychosis that come along with Louie body, it sounds like to me that it it's definitely something to look at. Um, and even if you aren't ready right now, get out there and look around and see what's available and what your options are. A lot of times that'll make you feel better about the whole process. Yeah. Um, go ahead, Evelyn. No, I just gonna I'm just agreeing with you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. You know, education helps us with stress because when we know something, then our brain doesn't have to sit there and make up things that, you know, and ruminate about things that aren't really happening. That doesn't necessarily um, affect isolation, um, but it can give you a sense of empowerment um, and maybe help you uh, reach out in a different way. Yeah, and rumination leads to looking inward. Um, what we want to do is be positive when we look inward. You know, what are my strengths? You know, what can I use to help me, you know, get through this, to, to help me smile? Yeah. You know, so many times, you know, I, I, I've done it. I'm guilty of it. I'm grumping around. I go like, okay, pretend like you're happy. Yeah. And you smile and, you know, you make phone call. And okay, now I feel better. And even if you're calling the area agency on aging, you know, they all have caregiver specialists and maybe they can make you smile, you know, telling you what might be available or even just talking, you know, talking about, you know, what you need to know about placement. They have the ombudsman program there and yeah. they can tell you how to, you know, which are the good places you might want to look at or not. You know, so it's all about, you know, trying to reach out in any way you can, being creative, being, being positive, you know, look at your situation. How can you fix it? How can you, you know, make your life better? Okay, Deborah, I see your message here that it's so expensive. Um, and yes, it is. Um, but there are ways... <laughs> Wish I knew where you were, Deborah. Would you tell us where you are? <laughs> um, because Medicaid does indeed pay for long-term care. And that's not saying that you have to be penniless. That's saying that 
uh, you may have to spend down some dollars in order to get eligible for Medicaid. And that all is dependent on what state you're in. Um, and so there are things that you might be able to do to make you feel more comfortable um, with that placement uh, decision. Oh, she's in the Den Denver area, not eligible for Medicaid. Um, okay, hmm. let me let me talk about that. <laughs> okay. You think you're not eligible for Medicaid because you're both in the community. But if you, if, you're, if your husband went to the hospital for a couple of days, became eligible for a skilled nursing facility placement, Medicaid, and I believe in Colorado, is one of the states that has the spousal impoverishment rule. And so what they do is they look at what you need to live where you are and what your husband needs to you know, pay in the nursing home. And they make sure that you have enough to live. So it's uh, it, you don't have to be eligible for regular community Medicaid to get into a uh, long-term care facility. And, and again, the people at the Area Agency on Aging know all about that, can help you walk right. through it. They can tell you who to call at Medicaid to talk to them about it. So reach out, reach out, take care of yourself. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, that, that spousal empowerment, impoverishment, we have that here in Texas also. Um, and it was actually marvelous when they passed that uh, legislation so that people in your situation, um, Deborah, um, wouldn't have to worry about that part. They just kind of separate everything and, and it, it helps a whole lot. So I would hope that you would look into that. Um, Teresa said she's able to get away a couple hours a week to volunteer, and that's a good way to not be isolated, uh, but you have to have the time, that's, that's true, and it's really helped her. Um, Jen says, surprisingly, usually guard, <laughs> okay, here we go back to this. I was on a train of thought, and that kind of surprised me, Jen. Uh, surprisingly, using gargling with a small amount of liquid for 10 seconds, then swallowing, this helps ground me. Oh, okay. I get that. Is that uh, wine? Huh? Is that wine? <laughs> well, I guess it could be, but we don't remember <laughs> that. Um, this helps me to move out of the fight, flight, freeze, fawn response and move to a more centered state of mind. The other one that I think is really good, Jen, is holding that ice cube in your hand because you have to focus on it. So it kind of centers you and brings you back to that. But I haven't heard this one before. I really like that. It costs nothing and it starts with you. What, how, that's great. That is great. Um, Becca says, not sure where in Denver, but it does look like there are some adult day service centers. Perhaps they are donation based and function under grants. That, that's, a, that's a possibility too. Um, at any rate, they would be cheaper than the nursing home placement if that's the way that you decide to go to free yourself up for a few hours a week to take care of you. Uh, and to reconnect with people. Um, Deborah is thanking us and um, hopefully this will help you, Deborah, reach out and get some more information, maybe some new information that will help you when you have to make these decisions. Um, yes, Jen, that does reset the vagus nerve, which connects to the sympathetic and parasympathetic systems. This neuroscience stuff, uh, here I am, I'm, I'm going away on my video. <laughs> It's just what we deal with. Um, <laughs> the neuroscience stuff is just amazing. It is absolutely amazing what they are finding that our brains can do. So it's exciting. It's eye-opening. Right. And you know, too, um, Medicare pays for mental health. That's true. And Medicaid has programs for people who are as sick as your husband to try to help them stay at home. Um, and again, if I were you, I would call your AAA and get information about those. They call it long-term care services and supports. And it is federally and state funded. And it is designed to keep people at home who are eligible for nursing home care. Absolutely. And, and and remember, there's a difference between Medicaid and the general public and Medicaid when it comes to long-term care. So um, you need to call the area agent on aging, probably talk to the benefits counselor there and let them go through this with you and explain it so that uh, 
you'll have the information to make the, the decision that's best for you and your husband. That's where we want to come from in this. Um, and Becca mentions long-term care insurance. I'm sure if you had that, you have looked into what, what uh, provisions there are in long-term care insurance. A lot of people don't have that. Um, some of us do and are grateful for it that we bought it when we were much younger because the cost does get in the way of purchasing long-term care insurance as you age, for sure. Well, it's only 7% of older adults have long-term care insurance. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, some of the other ideas that you had listed in your presentation, maybe bring those up and that may, um, you know, get people to think of other things. Well, you know, I talked a little bit about maybe joining a virtual support group or an online support group. Um, but I think, again, it's it's about being creative, about figuring out, OK, here's my here's my situation. And as Jen said, she's figured out some stuff and it sounds like she's been talking to Jamie Heisman. Yes, <laughs> for sure. But but just, you know, in listening to these things, you know, you pick up little little hints and you go, well, maybe, you know, and see if you can make it work. You know, if you can be creative, be healthy. You know, eat really well, dress well, maybe put some perfume on, put your lipstick on, feel good about yourself, figure out how to do that, sleep well, do your relaxation techniques, get your doctor checkups. You know, these things are extremely important. Learn something new. You know, a lot of times you're sitting at home and, you know, you're taking care of somebody and you've got, you know, there are online classes. Maybe you can learn a language you know, and make friends and wind up traveling in the long run, you know, with the person, you know, the people that you have classes with. Um, learn to dance. You can learn how to dance online. You know, if you do that, you know, you're going to be all prepped and ready for when you can get respite or get some break, get a break. Um, what else? Uh, for one thing I know is really important, know the signs and symptoms of depression. We've talked about this many times. You know, if you feel like nothing matters, you're depressed. I'm sorry, it's that easy. Yes. Yeah, yeah. and if you don't and, think you can make it another day, then you're suffering from burnout. Right, and nothing matters. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's if you start down that cycle, you're gonna start feeling sad. You're gonna, you're gonna start thinking negatively. You're going to be irritable. Um, you may change your eating and sleeping habits. Um, you may gain weight if you're isolated because you're doing emotional eating. We don't want that. It's so hard to get rid of that weight. <laughs> and, yes. You know, I, and, and ask for help from anybody you can. Maybe you're, you have a pastor. Um, maybe you used to have a pastor and can't go to church anymore. Maybe they'll do a home visit for you. Maybe they'll come out and see you because I know many churches do that. And adult day health care or even adult daycare in some states, they still have a grants for adult day health care, Medicaid grants. Um, you know, you can call, um, ask your doctor for a referral to a therapist and Medicare will pay for that. Ask your area agency on aging who they recommend or what they recommend. I mean, there's just there's we're going to send resources, um, you know, to you with your procession questionnaire, but you know, what's really important is you are your own resource. You need to figure it out. You need to be rabid about your self-care. Yeah, that's true. Perfect, true. Uh, Becca had another question for us and I do not have the answer for this. I think it's more of a financial planning kind of a question, but when should someone sign up for long-term care insurance? And that's so individualized. I don't think that we could just make a sweeping statement about when somebody should do that. Would you, Evelyn? Uh, do it when I was 20. <laughs> I would too. <laughs> I think I did it when I was in my 40s. It was offered through the state of Texas and my husband was employed with them. And I'm telling you, I don't let it lapse. Not at my age. I just don't. Yeah. Um, yes. And Minerva suggesting the stress busting program through your local area agency on it. Oh, right. And going and to the SOS centers in Texas. Texas, yes. right. Um, Deborah, <laughs> you really touched my heart and I want to just go and help you, you know, find a way to solve this, um, the situation that you're in right now, but you have to be your own advocate. 
-hmm. and uh, reach out and maybe try some of these things that our other wonderful caregivers have have uh, mentioned here. Um, and as Evelyn said, we're going to send out a follow-up email to you. If you register for the call today, you're going to have uh, these resources available there uh, on that. Um, and we will ask for your feedback about how you thought the session was. If there is a topic that you would like to hear us um, present here on the Caregiver Teleconnection, we'd love to hear that. Maybe you've been to a presentation somewhere and you've heard a wonderful speaker. Uh, let us know about that. We can reach out to them and try and get them on the Caregiver Teleconnection as well. And Evelyn was talking about what's coming up. Um, let's see, on the 23rd is Diversity in Caregiving at 10 o'clock, which Evelyn did mention. Um, also on the 23rd, I'll be back with you. Uh, with guess who? Dr. Jamie Heisman <laughs> at one o'clock in the afternoon. That's Thursday, February the 23rd. And this is a good topic. So tune in. Can we honestly say that we love ourselves? That's a good question. A very good question to ask ourselves. So we've got two sessions on the 23rd on Thursday. So join us for one or both of those because one's earlier and one is later in the day. We have about one minute left. Evelyn, do you have some um, final words that you would like to um, share? And I see here that Becca, before you do that, put in the website for Alzheimer's Association. Um, and I, I'm assuming, what is the CO? You probably know, Evelyn, I just don't. Connect uh, Alzheimer's. Oh, Colorado. 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 Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Yes, yeah. Right. Uh, Evelyn, final words. We have about a minute left. Isolation is deadly. That's kind of final words. Isolation is deadly. Well, we certainly do appreciate it, you joining us today on the Caregiver Teleconnection. As always, we so admire what you are able to do as a family caregiver. Um, it's not easy, and isolation just makes it so much worse. Um, I want to thank you for all of your input today, and hopefully we've been able to help Deborah. She's saying thank you, everyone. I hope we've been able to help her a little bit and maybe make her feel a little less isolated today during her day of caregiving. So thank you for joining us, and I hope to see you soon on other Caregiver Teleconnection sessions. Thank bye -bye. you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.